Hi guys. Um, today we have a, a pretty short discussion because it's a pretty simple idea, but um, it's a super useful one. So I wanted to make sure that that we cover it. So uh, Volimir's paper talks about kind of a different way to um, of using redundancy. Uh, so basically redundancy to reduce latency. And the idea there is that because we have multiple copies of the same data, right? So the same piece of data, some variable X can be stored on different servers, um, right? Like we had this system here where we had some process and another system here where we have some process P2, P1, cool. We have X that is stored in both locations and these are connected to an, through a network, right? So if you're some client here and you want to do a read on X, you can direct your query to either replica. And we would normally, or the way we discussed it is that a client might choose one or the other or be directed by some manager to one or the other um, replica to kind of load balance uh, the system, right? So the goal was to balance the load. But what the authors of this paper observe is that one of these replicas is bound to or can, in certain situations, return the answer earlier than the other. And so if we can send out two requests, then one of them will be faster than the other. And so if we want to increase um, the response time for the client, we should be sending multiple requests. Okay, so uh, the other idea is to not load balance, but to reduce latency. Okay. So um, the kind of central question of this paper is, um, on the other hand, we, on the one hand, we can reduce latency with multiple requests. And take and taking um, the first answer response. But on the other hand, multiple requests increase load. which can lead to queuing of requests, which then increases latency. <laughs> so what is the balance between these two? Can we safely increase load under some situations to decrease latency? Um, it's kind of not clear until this paper did, did the analysis, right? And so they have this nice result that replication is beneficial if server load is between 25 and 50%. So it's kind of a broad bound and there's a lot of caveats to that, but um, it's still kind of an interesting idea, right? So a lot of systems, so um, yeah, I guess I don't have to write it down, but lots of systems are actually relatively unloaded. So um, I talked, I remember talking to a guy from Google at a conference and um, I don't even know what I was trying to propose, but uh, I was asking some questions about some idea I had and the predicated thing was that servers are actually pretty loaded. And so, um, I don't know, I forget what my idea was, but he was like, no, 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 your assumption is wrong. Like Google servers are not loaded. If they get loaded at all, we just put up more servers. So we never want requests to be queued. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, well, that's really interesting. So in large systems, this is true, um, which made me really rethink my idea. So it turns out that this idea of server load being below 50% is actually um, 
like pretty much the norm. So um, yeah, so their technique could be used um, in, in a lot of cases, I think. Okay, so where does the variation in service performance come from? So if we have a server and it is responding to some requests, how long do those requests take, right? You could think about it as taking always the same amount of time, um, but that's actually not true. So if the server and the network are completely unloaded um, and the server is only running your program, then yeah, it's likely that request will take about the same amount of time or the variation is going to be extremely low. Right, if you have a server dedicated to just one program and it's all implemented in hardware on a chip, then you could even build a real-time system where the response is guaranteed uh, to take you know, within some amount of time. Okay, so in most cases though, this kind of goes back to the fallacies about distributed systems, uh, the network is busy. <laughs> Right? And it's busy with third-party traffic. Third-party traffic, I mean, just traffic that doesn't belong to your, to your application. So if you're sending a request to a server, it's going to, in a distributed system, traverse some network. And because that network is shared, it will be your request will be delayed by some third-party traffic or the response will be delayed by the third-party traffic. And so there's some variation of this. The traffic is not uniform because, um, I don't know, just like traffic in cities or you know any kind of um, flow in a network is going to tend to bunch up uh, because requests are coming from different parts of the network. They take different paths. The requests are made at different times. And so you have this momentary kind of congestion. And so that congestion could be a path on the path to one server but not the other and hence the difference in the response times. Okay? The servers are also serving different requests. They're not just running your program most of the time. So uh, hardware may be busy. Right, and that could be anything from the processor being working on something else. This could be from you know, memory being full with other programs data and so there needs to be more swapping in virtual memory. Um, it could be that the disk is busy or it's pointing to the wrong space on the platter and so it's going to take a while to get your disk rescheduled, right? So just from different programs kind of using the same hardware, you're going to have a lot of variation. And now depending on the variation happens, it could be large and small. Network effects will tend to be large. Hardware effects will tend to be small until you are, um, well, kind of depends, depends on sort of uh, software performance or profile, uh, software profile factors. But yeah, the hardware differences will be smaller than network effects. So um, either way, you're still going to get some variation in response times from two different servers. Okay. So together, we can kind of consider these factors independent of our program. And you can almost think of them as weather. Sometimes we, def we refer to network weather. Okay, so what these guys have observed is the following and the figure just kind of kind of hand draw the figure because you guys have seen the one in the um, in the paper but broadly we can put response time here on the x axis and server load on the y axis okay 
And so if we just send one request at a time, our response time might look like something like this. Okay, so this is one request. Okay. So as server load increases, this is kind of the background server load, right? Or the server load made even in our application by other requests, um, response time will go up. You know, and there's like a slightly upward curve to this um, just because of all the overhead of each request. So what these guys have observed is that if you send multiple requests, there tends to be this effect where on the low end, several, so this is two requests. Okay. Um, at the low end of server load, sending multiple requests actually improves the minimum response time of one of these requests, but as server load goes up, um, multiple requests take start taking longer because the server just has servers just have to do more stuff and so there is uh, some queuing that that enters the system so um, you can also kind of draw this line in comparison to the first blue line only where you know this kind of drops down at 50 percent of load okay so you can kind of push this benefit where the red line is below the blue line um, up to 50% if the variation in servers, server performance is particularly high, right? So for arbitrary variation between server performance, there's always benefit of sending two requests, right? So even if servers are almost 50% loaded, if one request takes a second and another one takes an hour, there's enough variation that even sending two requests is going to, to give you a benefit, right? So that's kind of the, the one of their end results, right? Um, so that's kind of good. So we know there's a bound to it at 50%, but uh, like I said, most of the servers are going to be less loaded than that or are likely to be less loaded than that. Uh, and so we should be, we should be below this line. The question is kind of where is this, where is this cutoff, right? Are we above it or are we below it? Okay. Um, so one other thing that they observed is that replication does not help when the cost of replication is high and server very performance variability low. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. It's kind of the, the, the sort of bottom of their, of their result um, or the other side of the result. So when the cost of client replication is high. And um, they talk about it in the paper one way. I kind of think about it in terms of a different type of illustration. So let's say that here we draw request time um, and here we have time on the x-axis so if we think about the server request time there is some there's some variation in how different responses get processed okay so maybe this is the response time on the server okay so then if we draw the client side of it, maybe the client takes very little time to, to send an individual request, right? This is very low variation, very short time. So the difference between, you know, this like a slow server response time here and a fast server response time here is large. So even when we multi replicate these requests, there's still a large benefit of getting the shorter response time compared to making a request, right? But if, let's say, it takes this long to make a client request, so this is client fast, client slow, okay? So when it takes this long to make a request, oh, that was awful, let me rewrite this. Um, 
All right, then if we made two requests, well, the second one would be somewhere here. And so that's actually a significant amount of time compared to the server, to the server variation, right? So it could be that we're making the request, we're making the request here, okay? That's how long it takes to make the second request. And then on top of that, we need to wait this long, okay? So we have kind of like time to make a request plus time to get the response. Okay. That actually might be longer than making the some requests here, just making one request and then even waiting for the slow response, right? That's actually lower. So in this case, making two requests doesn't actually help you all that much and you're still paying the overhead of increased queuing, right? So as you're queuing, the server response times will actually will actually go up, right? Because you have queuing on top of it, right? So that's kind of where uh, the bottom of the 25 load percent is. So in case where um, there is significant cost to making requests, then replication is not going to, to help you, right? So one, impl one implementation idea that they proposed, and this was in the networking context, context is to replicate requests but mark the duplicates and then to prioritize the original requests. Okay, so this is what happens in the network where you can send multiple packets, but only the primary packets gets prioritized. So if the network is unloaded, the secondary packets are going to get through to the servers as well. Now, I think you could extend it to server queues as well because they're not that different from network queues. Um, and so the primary requests would always get processed first by the, by the servers and the secondary requests only if there's nothing, no primary request in front of them. So even with that special treatment for packets in the network, I think you could still do it on your servers. And the interesting thing, which kind of brings it back full circle, is that if you think of the blockchain network, the blockchain network does full replication in the sense that when you have a new block, that block being announced is basically a request for a new block from, from the miner pool. And all the miners start processing, uh, the process, start processing creating a new block right away and the winner gets the new block, right? So you're replicating the request, you're rewarding the first answer and you're kind of ignoring all the other ones, right? So their idea is actually not that new, but uh, it's interesting to think about applying it in distributed systems in general. And it's interesting kind of the analysis they did in the show and see how uh, replication does in fact help in real systems. So just a really simple idea, pretty elegant paper that's relatively new. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it.